Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Love Over Fear show. This is Chelsea here coming to you live for today's episode. I'm really excited for today's episode of the Love Over Fear show. Um, this is going to be all about connecting with your inner child. This is going to be a very experiential episode. I'm very excited to be sharing um, these practices with you. I'm going to be giving you something that you can take home and use and implement um, because I truly believe that, that healing is not conceptual. Healing is embodied. Right? Healing is something we live. It's how we breathe. It's how we move through the world. It's how we behave. It's how we respond. It's not just knowing things conceptually. It's actually living in a new way, responding to our emotions, meeting ourselves differently, showing up in our lives, in our relationships differently from a place of love and compassion instead of fear and overprotection. So today's episode is going to be really beautiful, might be a bit emotional, that's okay. Um, we have to be able to be with our emotions in order to truly heal. So if you're with me live, say hello, connect with me. I'm very excited to be here. Taking a sip of tea. And I think I'm just going to dive in today. I really want to get started and share what I have with you today. So again, if you're with me live, if you're watching live, please do feel free to interact. I love hearing from you. I love reading your comments. I love the interaction. Um, hi, Yasmin. Thank you. Um, my whole world is digital. <laughs> So it's really nice to even have the live interaction. Hi, Chris, uh, even in the digital space. So how about we all take a breath together? Whether you're watching live, whether you play, let's just pause for a moment and take a conscious breath. Maybe this is your first conscious breath of the day, just pausing, slowing down. Breathing intentionally. Oh, hello, everybody joining. And let's let's dive in. So again, today's episode is all about seeing your inner child. This month's theme in the Moving Beyond Fear Facebook group is self-compassion. And this is one of the many ways that we can begin to put self-compassion into practice. When we are so used to judging criticizing, shaming, and blaming ourselves, self-compassion can feel so foreign. We might not know what to do or how to do it. Hi, Lindsay from Canada. Hi. You might feel a bit lost of like, how? How do I begin to embody compassion? How do I start to meet myself with compassion instead of feeling shame and judgment when I feel anxiety? So most of us, most of us have a strained relationship with our anxiety. Most of us feel shame when we go into anxious spirals. So many of us criticize ourselves and judge ourselves for having the thoughts and having the emotions that we do. And this only fuels the cycle of anxiety. When we're constantly meeting the anxiety with resistance, when we constantly believe that there's something wrong with us or something wrong with our life when we experience anxiety, when we make it mean something about who we are, when we make it mean something about our relationships, this is what fuels the cycle of anxiety. And if you're with me live, do you find yourself judging and criticizing yourself when you feel anxious? Like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I shouldn't. Be, I hate that I have this thought. I remember I said out loud one time when I was in the thick of my anxiety, I just hate myself sometimes. I hated this about myself. I hated that I was constantly in my head. I hated that I couldn't just be present in my relationship 
I hated that I felt tormented by my thoughts. And that was my relationship with my anxiety, it was one of resistance, shame, and judgment. I was layering judgment and pain and suffering on top of the suffering I was already experiencing. And it just made the whole experience feel even more unbearable. Yeah, feeling trapped in my head, very relatable. Yeah, I just felt like I was stuck, felt like I was trapped. And a lot of times when we believe that we're trapped, we start to panic, right? It's almost like claustrophobia. You like, <gasps> you start to panic. And that <laughs> when you start panicking because you feel trapped, you just feel more anxious, which makes you feel more trapped. And we can really see how this cycle only strengthens when we meet our anxiety with shame, judgment, resistance, hatred. So today I wanna give you a completely new perspective on how to see and relate to your anxiety so that you can start meeting yourself and your anxiety with compassion. Yes, I hate that I don't feel safe in my relationship and hate not having positive feelings more often. So this is the current pattern and this is actually fueling the anxiety. This is fanning the flames. When we say, I hate that I experienced this because we're, we're telling ourselves that we shouldn't be feeling this way. And the fact that we are, that means there's something wrong and, oh, there's something wrong with me. I, I shouldn't be feeling this way. What is wrong with me? Why can't I, why can't I? So I want to give you a completely new perspective today on your anxiety, one that will allow you to soften, to soften around your anxiety instead of go, ah, right? When I think about criticism, judgment, shame, hate, I just think of like, ah, you're just like bracing yourself. You're clenching your fists and your jaw. Even just notice for yourself, what is the embodiment of my relationship with my anxiety? Is it one of tension and resistance and frustration and judgment? Is it a lot of finger wagging and oh, uh, I even feel just like exhausted just embodying that for a moment. How exhausting this cycle is. Anxiety, shame, anxiety, shame, anxiety, shame. Okay. So let's, let's create a new pattern. Let's create an alternative path. Let's create a new relationship with the anxiety. And I'm going to reference the work of Dr. Russell Kennedy today. He is the author of award-winning book, Anxiety Rx. It either came out early this year or last year. Highly recommend it. I'll go ahead and type the title in the comments. Uh, highly recommended. <laughs> so, um, he is one of the guest lecturers in our live group program, The Luscious Love Immersion, and he did a class yesterday. And I was already planning on doing this topic today, but just his teaching just added a different, deeper dimension to today's episode. So I'm really excited. So Dr. Russell Kennedy said in our class yesterday that our anxiety is our inner child trying to get our attention. I'm going to say that again. Our anxiety is our inner child trying to get our attention. When we don't understand our anxiety, we're only going to meet it with frustration, confusion, hatred, and shame. But when we really understand our anxiety, we can finally begin to meet it differently. So today, we're going to see our anxiety as this younger part of us this younger, scared, hurt part of us that is just trying to get our attention. It's trying to get their needs met. So I'm going to give some examples. Often underneath intrusive thoughts are deeper pains and fears from these younger parts of us. Maybe it was really early childhood. Maybe it was, you know, middle school, high school. A lot of my uh, pain and fears a lot of it were around like middle school and high school. So even though I wasn't like a little kid, that was still, that's still the younger part of me 
that I know is underneath the anxiety and the intrusive thoughts. So maybe you have different phases of your life where you experience different things. So it doesn't matter what age this younger part of you is. It could have been even like earlier 20s, maybe in your th you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s. So it's just this younger part of you, whether you want to see it as a child, adolescent, young adult, it's a younger part of you trying to get your attention. So underneath the intrusive thoughts are often deeper pains and fears. I'm going to give some examples so that you can really, really see what I mean. So say you have an intrusive thought that says, I'm not attracted to my partner or that person is more attractive than my partner. And you feel that sense of anxiety and fear around that thought. Underneath that intrusive thought of I'm not attracted to my partner or other people are more attractive than my partner or my partner is not the most attractive person in this room right now. Let's go underneath that intrusive thought. And what I, often like to have my clients ask themselves is what would it mean about you if you didn't have the most attractive partner well it would mean that like i picked someone not very attractive okay and what would that mean about you if you didn't pick the hottest smartest whateverest partner well that would mean something about me it would mean that like my choice wasn't the best choice and my choices are a reflection of my worthiness so if i don't have the most attractive partner i'm unworthy i didn't make a good choice i didn't make the best choice the perfect choice so as we can see just that intrusive thought alone often underneath is feelings, deeper feelings of unworthiness. Let's pick another example. And choose a thought of, what if my partner leaves me? Okay, let's go into it. What if your partner left you? Oh my God, I would feel, oh, I would feel so much pain. I would feel, oh my gosh, I would be abandoned. I would experience loss and grief, okay? So really underneath that intrusive thought is pain around being abandoned, feelings of loss and grief. So underneath each intrusive thought is often a deeper emotion, pain, or fear. And what we often do is we stay up on the surface of the intrusive thought and we try to figure it out. <gasps> How can I make sure my partner never leaves me? I'm going to check their phone. I'm going to analyze their text messages. How can I make sure that I'm always attracted to my partner because they have to be the most attractive partner. They have to be the hottest person ever, the hottest person I've ever dated. <gasps> How can I make sure that I'm making a good choice when really what's underneath are these deeper pains, these deeper fears. And the most common pains and fears that I see in doing this work with hundreds of clients experiencing relationship anxiety, the most common fears and pains that I see underneath the intrusive thoughts are unworthiness, right? Fear of failure, fear of, fear of making a mistake is really unworthiness, feeling unworthy, believing you're unworthy, not wanting to be seen as unworthy by yourself or others or God, <laughs> fears of abandonment, and fear and pain around grief and loss. I'm afraid to lose my partner and experience grief. And often these emotions are rooted in experiences from when we were younger, where we did learn that we were unworthy, where we did experience abandonment, whether physically, emotionally, our parents weren't very loving or affectionate, so it felt like they were distant and in a way, they were emotionally abandoning us. Grief or loss, you lost a family member as a child and, and no one really talked about it. Or maybe you, you had an ex in the past and they left you. And so that younger part of you, that younger version of you is still carrying that grief 
and that loss and that pain. These younger parts of you that experienced such pain that this pain becomes stored in the body and manifests as anxiety. Someone asked a question. Can you go beneath the intrusive thought of questioning your feelings for your partner? Um, give me the exact thought. <laughs> give me the exact thought. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do this for everyone, but, um, you know, giving the examples, I'm sure helps. Give me the exact thought, the scary thought that you have so much anxiety around. Give it to me. <laughs> mm. And of course, you know, when we go into this together, you might, it, it's going to be more specific, but I'm just going to give some general examples of what I have often seen when people have these kind of intrusive thoughts about, you know, do I really love my partner? <gasps> do I love my partner enough? Are we in love enough? Yeah. So I'll just go with that example. Like, do, do I really love my partner? Okay, what would happen if the answer was no? What if you didn't really love your partner? <gasps> oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I really love my partner. I don't know if I really love my wife. That would mean if I don't really love them, then that obviously means that I have to leave them. And if I have to leave them, I'm going to experience all this pain, grief, and loss. Or, or I'm going to hurt my partner and they're going to hate me. And that would make me feel really shitty and unworthy. So underneath, is, it sounds like maybe fears of loss and pain. If you've lost someone before. Or fears of being unworthy because you hurt someone and that makes you a bad person. So you want to make sure, because we learn in our society that that relationships are only rooted in feelings of love. So when you're taught that relationships are only rooted in feelings of love, and that's the one thing that keeps you together, then that's the one thing you're going to focus on, your feelings. Because, oh my gosh, if these feelings aren't there, that means I can't stay. And that means I'm going to hurt this person. They're going to hate me. and They're going to think I'm a piece of shit and that I'm a shitty person and I'm unworthy. And here we go. So, again, common underlying pains and fears, unworthiness, abandonment, grief and loss, okay? And these are usually rooted, these are younger parts of ourselves that are carrying and storing this pain and looking around. <gasps> Oh God, I don't want to, oh God, I don't want to feel that again. Oh no, but what if this happens again? And oh goodness. And we, we develop these adaptive behaviors to make sure that this inner child doesn't feel this again. So we go into overthinking, we go into ruminating, we go into controlling behaviors, we go into looking for certainty. Because if I can have certainty, that means I'll never feel this pain. It's like all of these walls and layers that are protecting the pain that our younger selves are carrying. So what do we do then when we experience anxiety? If we know that it's a younger part of us who's carrying this pain of being unworthy, of abandonment, of grief and loss, if we know that, then how can we relate to our anxiety differently? If we know that when we're anxious, it's really the, the younger part of ourselves being activated. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to be seen as unworthy again. I, I was taught as a child that God would be disappointed in me and would send me to hell. That was me. Oh, my gosh. Mom, and, Mom will be so mad at me. Dad will be so mad at me. Oh, my gosh. They're going to leave. They're going to leave. Oh my gosh, I'm going to experience loss. I'm going to experience grief and, I, and I, I don't know what to do with it. No one ever told me what to do with it. It's too big. It's too scary. That's the younger part of us crying out, saying, no one ever saw this part of me. 
No one ever tended to this. And I'm asking you, I'm telling you, <laughs> but this pain is still here. This fear is still here. So what do we do then when we experience <sighs> the anxiety? First thing first, and we're going to do the experiential work now. First things first, when we begin to experience anxiety is we want to connect with the sensation because the adaptive behaviors, overthinking, ruminating, seeking certainty, seeking control, these just pull us deeper and deeper and deeper into the fear, into the mind, and never actually get to the core pain and emotion that is yearning for our attention. So when you're experiencing anxiety, we want to connect with the sensation. Usually anxiety takes place in throat, chest, solar plexus, or gut. Sometimes a combination. So in this moment, maybe you're feeling anxious right now, or maybe you can remember how you were anxious yesterday. Take a moment to notice. And it might be difficult to notice this at first if you are always in your mind. Know that this is going to take practice, okay? See if you can notice if there's an energy or a tension or a temperature or pressure somewhere between here and here. Maybe you know it very well. You're like, my gut goes crazy, the nausea. Maybe, oh, my chest gets so tight and it's hard to, hard to breathe. We want to just connect with the sensation. This is the stored pain and emotion of your younger self. This is the stored, unresolved pain and emotion of your younger self, of your inner child that's being flared up and activated and saying, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> the pain is still here. The fear is still here. Okay, so connect with the sensation. No matter how many times the thoughts try to pull you up into, oh God, but you've got to figure this out. You've got to make sure, you've got to check your feelings. You've got to go to, you've got to check your partner's text messages. You've got to see the, but the, but the, but the, but the, but the, but the, you've got to think about the future. No matter how many times the mind does that, the mind is a very strong gravitational pull. So again, this is going to take time, but connect with the sensation. Where are you experiencing the fear, the emotion, Dr. Russell Kennedy refers to it as the alarm, the alarm in your body. And I want you to place your hand over it. Maybe it's multiple parts. Just create some containment and some holding and some support for this inner child, this younger part that is feeling all of this pain and fear and emotion. Just like when a, a child outside of us is hurting and upset, we don't go into rationalizing. We soothe them non-verbally first. We go, come here. Oh, breathe with me. Oh, give me a hug. And many of us didn't really have that model to us. So we're, we're learning to reparent our inner child. So we want to non-verbally soothe them first. We want to soothe the emotion, be with the emotion, the stored pain that our inner child is still carrying. So placing your hands over the parts of your body that are feeling the intense emotion, the activation, the pain, the fear. Provide that support for the younger part of you that is hurting and afraid. And then we're gonna take deep breaths with the intention of creating some space around those parts of your body. So much, so often we feel that trapped feeling. We feel contracted, constricted. So we wanna actually create some space for this emotion to have space and to move. So just, if it helps, you can close your eyes or just focus on one thing and just feel space being created in your body as you breathe. The mind may be like, oh God, you got to figure this out. <sighs> Keep bringing your attention back to the emotion, the sensation in your body. 
hold it, create space, create space in your belly, create space in your chest, create space in your throat. And you're going to keep doing this until the intensity of the emotion begins to feel like it's softening. The goal doesn't need to be making it all go away, but just to soften around it. Just like you would soothe a child who's scared. Maybe you begin to provide nurturing touch to this younger part of you who is feeling afraid, who's still carrying this pain. Our first step do not skip this, is to soothe and regulate the pain, the fear, and the emotion. Because you have already lost access to clear and rational thinking when you are in this place of alarm, fear, and anxiety, and emotion. So trying to think at this point is useless. Okay? So we're just going to focus on soothing. Maybe you need to like move a little bit. I often have to kind of like open my chest because I feel a lot of anxiety here. It feels like that trappedness. So I create space by moving my shoulders, lengthening your spine. Maybe you feel collapsed and powerless. How simple this is, just breathing, soothing, connecting with the sensation. And as you're creating space around the sensation your body is, as you're soothing it, just notice any shifts in the sensation. We're not addressing the thoughts at this point. It's a moot point to try to address your thinking when you're in an anxious state because the thinking is irrational. So we're not even going to try to fight irrational thinking with rational thinking. We don't need to do that. Not when we're in the midst of the anxiety, the pain. When the inner child takes over, <gasps> rational thinking won't help a child <laughs> when they're scared. Okay? Soothing, supporting, nurturing. And this is what, this is how we offer compassion, embodied compassion to the inner child, the younger part of us who is expressing their fear and their pain to us. <gasps> I'm afraid of loss. I'm afraid of getting hurt. I'm afraid of hurting someone and then being a bad person. I'm afraid of being unworthy. I'm afraid of disappointing God. I'm afraid of disappointing other people. I'm afraid of experiencing grief because I... I don't know what to do with grief. I never learned. It's too big. We're offering compassion, embodied compassion. Oh, yes. I feel the fear. Yes, I feel the pain. Oh, you're scared. Oh, it is scary. That's what we're communicating to that inner child when we soothe, when we connect with the emotional body. And you're going to stay with that until you feel like the intensity has come down a bit. Until the thoughts aren't screaming at you anymore. Until the sense of urgency has calmed down. At the height of the anxiety, that feeling of urgency is really intense. And it goes, oh my God, you got to figure this out. Oh God, oh God. We want to ride that out. Soothe the emotion, the pain of the younger self. Help that part of us feel safe. And only after we feel more regulated, only after we feel like we've kind of like, oh God, woken up. <laughs> after the inner child has taken, stopped driving the car and wanting to crash it, then we can become curious. We can become curious about that inner child's pain and fears, the younger parts of us that are carrying that pain and fear that's being activated right now. And we can ask our inner child, 
are you willing to share with me what that was about? Why it felt so scary to you to lose someone? To not pick the right person to make a mistake? Are you willing to share with me why that feels so scary? And see how I'm approaching it with a place of neutrality and curiosity. If you're still in that, <laughs> this is not the time. We want to wait till our rational brain comes back online and we can have this curious, neutral approach. Are you willing to share with me why it feels so scary to make a mistake? Are you willing to share with me why it feels so scary for someone to leave you? And initially the inner child might not yet be ready. The inner child might not yet trust you. The inner child might still be too protective, but keep asking. And eventually the younger part of you, the inner child may say, I just, I always thought that if I made a mistake, that God would be mad. Oh, when did you learn that? I learned that since I was six years old. And then I learned it again, and then I learned it again, and then I learned it again. And then I was rejected when I made a mistake. And then I was yelled at when, and shamed when I didn't do things perfectly. Or then I saw my mom and dad fight and my dad would storm out and I felt so scared and now I'm always scared that someone's going to storm out on me. And we begin to slowly understand the pain that these younger parts of us are carrying. It's not all going to come flooding in at once. It's a gradual process of your inner child beginning to trust but it can reveal these very sacred wounds to you as the adult. You're now the adult. And when we get anxious and panicked and we can't see clearly, the inner child has taken over. So when we soothe and regulate, we step back into the adult that is present. And then we can relate to the inner child and say, whoa, why did that quote on the internet make you so scared. Oh, what was it that you were feeling? And then in those moments when the inner child says, I'm so afraid of getting hurt because it really sucked when I was bullied. And I'm always afraid of people rejecting me. And so I kind of push people away before they can even yet close because I learn that if I'm myself I'm gonna get it made fun of and in those moments when the inner child reveals to us the emotion living underneath the intrusive thought the pain the deeper fear I'm afraid that I'm not enough then we can have corrective experiences with the inner child and we can go Oh, I love you. What do you need from me as the adult in this moment? What did you need then that you didn't have? I needed someone to just hold me. I needed someone to tell me that, that I wasn't a fuck up, that I was lovable. I needed someone to yell at my dad and tell him to stop. And in those moments, we can meet the needs of the inner child. Hold them. Let them know that they are loved and seen and cared for. Let them know that you are now going to hold boundaries. That you are going to support them and provide what they needed. When we have these corrective experiences with the inner child, we heal our anxiety. 
It's a woodpecker. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Woodpecker pecking on my house. When we have these corrective experiences where we see the emotion and the pain of our younger selves and we meet it and we soothe it and we love through the pain, love the pain, love them as they experience the fear and the pain. We heal the anxiety because the inner child will see, oh, someone's there for me. I am safe. I don't need to panic and freak out and overthink and control and try to figure everything out and hide and cling. I don't need to do that anymore. I'm safe now. And then we go through the world with this inner experience of safety and support. With so much more compassion and understanding for ourselves. Compassion and understanding for our pain. Knowing that it's just a younger part of us trying to get our attention. Needing our love. Needing to be soothed held, nurtured. I promise you, if you make this a practice, there's no way things can't change. There's no way. Because you're gonna build a whole new relationship with yourself and your emotions. And instead of saying, I hate this, you, you're gonna start saying, I get it. I get it. And I hear you. And you make sense. And that sucked that that happened. And I love you. I love you. And then that love that is created within your own self begins to overflow. It overflows into your relationship, into your life. And then you begin to understand other people's behavior. Maybe your partner is getting all frustrated. Maybe your partner feels scared. And then you, you begin to know there's probably a younger part in there that's still carrying some pain. And therefore I don't need to judge them because I don't judge myself anymore. I don't shame myself anymore. So therefore, I, I don't shame anybody else. And the level of resonance and congruence that you will experience in your body-mind is... It's freedom. It's freedom. So instead of seeing your anxiety as a problem, as a nuisance, as something to hate about yourself, see it as a younger part of you, letting you know that it's still carrying some pain and some fears, and it just wants to be held. You don't need to go into your thoughts. Those are just the adaptive behaviors. If I could just think my way out of this, if I could just be sure, if I could just control this, if I could just know, those are the adaptive behaviors rooted in fear and self-protection. Go deeper than that. Go deeper than that. And I get it. It's hard to do that because the pattern of the self-protection is so strong that it's hard to sometimes access those deeper emotions and fears on our own. There have been many, many times where I get stuck in all of this and it's hard for me to drop down into this. And this is why we have the option to have support from others who can help you soothe and then become curious and hold space for the younger part of you 
And this is, this is what we do at Healing Embodied. We help you create that new pattern, shift that relationship with your anxiety. Heal from the inside out. Stop playing whack-a-mole with the thoughts and heal the emotional pain that is fueling the anxiety and the need to be so hyper-vigilant in your relationship. That's what we do. And we have an incredible, amazing live group program that we run. It's called the Luscious Love Immersion. And we would love to have you in it. It's an eight week program. We do live sessions. We go deep. This program is for um, women and femmes only at this time. We do have other services um, for other genders. Um, but at this time, this is focused on women and femmes. So if you need help and support navigating the complexity of your inner world, seeing beyond the thoughts, going beneath the surface, then please, please, please check out our live group program, The Luscious Love Immersion. I have posted the link. You can get all the info there and you can either sign up and get started right away or you can apply for a free 30-minute relationship anxiety assessment at the bottom of the page where you can meet with a member of our team one-on-one -on -one just to get more detail to confirm that it is a good fit. Um, we can answer any questions that you have. So this work is a game changer and I would love to hold space for you as you learn to hold space for your inner child, for your emotions, to get out of this. We got to get out of this and into this. Okay. That's, that's what all of our services at Healing Embodied support you in doing because that is what changes everything. Okay. So please, please, please check out the link. See if it feels, see if you feel that pull that, oh my gosh, yes, this is what I need. And then have your inner parent step up and say, baby girl, we're doing this. Baby girl, I got you. Okay. <laughs> sending you all so much love, sending your inner children so much love. Take a breath. And until next time, I can't wait to see you embrace love wholeheartedly.